This is the OGM weekly call for Thursday, September 8th, 2022. Uh, and we are gathered here first to uh, pick a topic for today's conversation. Uh, Ken, why don't you try saying something again, see if it's better. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, you're like the Verizon guy. All right, yes. So I was asking how far does April walk in a single day on this uh, so, trip? So today's walk was 14 kilometers. Oh, that's uh, not bad. Which is not bad at all. And I think I think max day is maybe 20 some kilometers or something like that. It's it's not none, none of the days is terrible. And I was just relating that that she's picked up a habit of trail walking, running on Fridays in good weather, uh, Forest Park near here, which is like a marathon in length. Mm -hmm. So so she'll she'll do 26 miles and then come stop at a cafe, coffee shop that's between the park and home and then walk home and and then she's like, okay, next. <laughs> and I'm like, how do you, how, how, how do you do that? <clears throat> um, so we were entertaining topics in the uh, Google group. Uh, happy to sort of uh, surface some of those. There were a couple other thoughts on the Mattermost channel. Eve, thanks for joining. Yay. Great to see you. Lovely to see you. Thank you. Awesome. Um, we're at, so, so Eve, we've been alternating formats uh, for these Thursday calls. Last week was the regular old check-in format where I just go through the little rectangles in Zoom and everybody talks about what's OGME in their life. And this week we're uh, picking a topic and we haven't picked a topic yet. So the, our first order of business, so to speak, is uh, to kick around what we would like to spend this time talking about. And there were several different ideas floated um, on our various media. Uh, and Eric is saying on the chat, don't pick my topic. So, uh, so I will wait it less than, than the others then. But uh, who would like to throw in a candidate? Yeah, Pete is totally right. Er Eric, that was a very clever way to get us to talk about your topic, but still. <laughs> I threw mine in the chat. Yeah, and um, this idea of great... Let me read it out. Uh, how are people coping with the dynamic tension between a great sense of urgency to act on big issues like climate change and the rise of extremism and authoritarianism with the reality that as individuals, it's very hard to find a place to stand and leverage to bring about the needed changes. Um, I really like that topic. I think, uh, I think that poll is fabulous. I'm seeing a lot of, I'm seeing a lot of this and nods of affirmation there being anybody else would like to float a uh, a candidate topic yeah i did uh, post yesterday a couple of economics topics one was from nomi prince um and i was fascinated by by the way she framed um the the uh doom of the future so uh, there is there are a lot of people who think a collapse is coming and she's basically in agreement with that but with a twist to it uh, without really uh and explaining the cause of this twist so in a nutshell she's saying that we are in for disruptive changes that equal the invention of the combustion and steam engines which transformed our cities uh, in a fairly short period of time and then other uh, inventions like electricity, like the internet and so on, that, that uh, created uh, major disruptions. <clears throat> but, then, but then she's saying that the crash that is coming now will be nothing like 2008. Um, it, will be, it will be changing American cities and, and communities around the world really in ways that we can't even fully imagine. Um, and then, but she, she, so she keeps spinning on this, but she doesn't really go down as to why uh, she thinks that these changes will be so disruptive. And uh, I think we, we would say, well, we know because we have run out of resources in the natural world to continue using uh, exploitations of natural resources to feed economic growth. So with that coming to an end, the shift will be will be fantastic, uh, and so she's saying there will be 
there will be lose, winner, winners and losers again because the industry is going to shift into different uh, sectors of the economy and innovate new new structures. So there will be a lot of people getting very rich again, but other sectors will uh, will lose and and vanish now in the process. You're very interesting. And Grace was saying in the chat that uh, I don't know about coming soon. Seems like it's already happening. And she is one of the people in inventing <laughs> alternate alternate schemes for how things might work. I'm just showing my brain on Nomi because I looked here quickly as you brought her, her up. I've not read any of her books, but I'm, I'm quite amused that the titles are, it takes a pillage behind the bonuses, bailouts, and backroom deals from Washington to Wall Street. Collusion, how central bankers rigged the world. All the president's bankers, the hidden alliances that drive American power. Other people's money, the corporate mugging of America. Permanent distortion, how the financial markets abandoned the real economy forever, which I think is her latest book. I'm not sure. And I don't think I have all her books here, uh, but super interesting. Uh, I and, thought and from, a, from a constructive perspective, um, it's worth contemplating where we think the economy is going to go, because you can really put some pieces together and, uh, and understand that given current natural resource depletions, um, the, there are only so many responses and they're not electric cars, right? I mean, electric cars are not going to the solution. Even, even the electric system as it is envisioned, because you couldn't build enough batteries for ones to, to empower all this. So where is this thing most likely going to go? It's really you know, a great puzzle. Um, thanks, Klaus. And then I, I, I sort of dipped in with you because I like this being a little excursion into the topic with us, but I want to come back to the group and say between the two topics. Uh, so hold up a one if the first topic that came up, the one that Ken proposed feels good, hold up a two fingers if what Klaus just uh, recommended sounds good. Uh, <laughs> nice, Grace. Grace, Grace, you cannot game the system that way. <laughs> Demerit, demerits in the value, in the value uh, system for Grace. Uh, and combine it. Uh, we could also do topic fusion, where uh, where we go there. My 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 fear with the Nomi Prince topic is that I've not read any of her works. I feel very lightly loaded for the the journey into the topic. I would just absorb, and I don't I don't know how many of us are are like up on uh, up on all that uh, content in some sense. But it sounds good. Um, other thoughts. Uh, Klaus, what is that long, long link? Rogue well, that is a talk she was uh, she was giving uh -huh. there, um, and the, there is no real conclusion to this conversation. But as she leads up to um, promoting her book here, uh, there are a lot of jewels in there. Uh, that and, I mean, she she is advisor to the World Bank, to Goldman Sachs, to governments, and so on. So she really is. A very influential person that an uh, influential person that I never heard of before. Love that. Thank you. Um, cool. So why don't we start in on Ken's topic and see if we might fold in Klaus's topic and go from there. Uh, there we go. Um, and Ken, if you'd like to sort of uh, start to breathe us into it, that would be great. Okay. Thank you. So this is something I've been struggling with for a long time. Um, I'd say I first started, my ecological awareness started in 1987 when I read Buckminster Fuller's Critical Path and it accelerated in the early 1990s when I moved to California and did a lot of work with the Buddhist Peace Fellowship and Joanna Macy and John Seed and Council of All Beings. And, you know, this is very in the woo woo weeds there of, um, you know, trying to become more ecologically aware. And over the last 30 years, I feel like the acceleration of um, it, Tom Atley once said, everything's getting better and better and worse and worse, faster and faster. And from the standpoint of worse and worse, you know, we're watching the, the world literally burning up in front of our eyes. Um, this week, I mean, I was 111 degrees in the next town over for me yesterday, two days ago. So the, the, the climate weirdness is here. It's really happening. Um, watching the the rise of authoritarianism the erosion of dem democratic rights it makes me really anxious and i don't have a lot of ground to stand on <clears throat> to try and and cope with it so 
And uh, if you take a Venn diagram of better and better, worse and worse, faster and faster, if you're in better and better, you sound like Pollyanna and no one wants to listen to you because you're ungrounded and you're saying, oh, it's, it's all going to be fine. If you're in worse and worse, you sound like Chicken Little and people are like, go away, the world's, the sky's not falling, you know, the world's going to hell. And if you're in faster and faster, you just sound like a maniac. So I think we have to actually become larger than all three of those circles and hold them as a, this is true, all this is happening. And where can we find in ourselves and our communities, the resources to hold these dynamic tensions and find ways of being effective? Um, traditional organizing seems to be um, one path of that, but it seems inadequate. Um, I don't know if anybody's aware, but what's going on in my town right now, there was a brutal police takedown of a, a, two, a six foot two, 250 pound cop took down a five foot tall Latino man in the canal area who was totally cooperative. He was sitting there drinking some beer after work and they're like, and you, know, you shouldn't be doing this. And he said, give me your ID. And he stood up, he says, sit down. He said, I have to stand up to get my wallet out. He said, sit down. And he, he didn't sit down. So this cop just took him, beat him, gave him a broken nose concussion, pushed his face into the pavement, all bloody. Then he went back and took a freaking snapshot with his camera as a trophy photo. And he lied on his report and really lied. And so there was a city council meeting the other night and hundreds of people showed up and they, they're saying, this is not an isolated incident. This is the police. The canal in, in Center Fell is their one square mile ghetto where we hold all of the immigrants. There's just over 30 languages spoken there. Um, it, people live sometimes 20 to a, a two bedroom apartment sleeping in shifts. So there's this, this sense of what really impressed me was the other night, all these young people stood up and said, we're the next generation and we're not going to stand by and put up with this shit the way our parents did. We're not going to be quiet. We're going to be out here all the time. So I think there's a new generation that's really on fire and i love things like extinction rebellion and sunrise movement and you know but i'm i'm just personally don't quite know exactly how to handle this and, and these things pull on me all the time and it's really disruptive you know um so i'm just i'm wondering what other people do how do how do people on this call hold all these tensions where do you find effective actions um what can we do together that would that would support each other and maybe make a little dent in the world. That's my framing. Ken, thank you. That's, that's really beautiful. Um, and to dramatically oversimplify, uh, there's two big sides of this. One of them is the coping side, is just how do you absorb, deflect, defer, process, uh, you know, how do you maintain stability in the face of all the kinds of news that we're seeing these days? And then the other side is how do you act? So exactly. maybe, maybe sort of coping and acting. And, and the acting is really complicated. In some cases, it's really simple because, you know, I can save that starfish kind of attitude. You know, I save that one. Cool. And, and people helping individuals really matters. There was a lovely piece in the New York Times yesterday or the day before about how very small random acts of kindness really help. The, the, the givers of small kindnesses underestimate the effect of their kindness on the receivers and that those things are, are pretty major. Um, so anybody who would like to jump in, please, please do. Uh, Mr. Kelly. All right. Thank you. Um, so two, two short, uh, rules, principles, guidelines, whatever you call it. First one is figure out in terms of your experience, but also your intuitive, you know, what your heart is telling you, you know, what are you drawn towards and where do you, what do you have some whatever, skill, ex experience, you know, that would give you leverage. So for me, that is in, um, actually, it's a pretty, it's a very specialized area. It's the pre-voting part of democracy. It's, it's what happens with groups of people that allow them to learn from each other and to hang out with each other. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis on civility in the, in the literature very important, but there's a lot of cognitive stuff that's not being looked at at all, which is how do you make it more interesting for people to learn that it, in a way that is not part of a debate or not part of a competition exactly. It's a, it's a softened debate. And, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that, that I'm trying to create in that space. But a second principle is uh, check yourself. You know, consider how 
broad are the definitions of bias, consider how easy it is to uh, to be deluded. Uh, and and you you know you say, well, gee, I know about the major delusions. <laughs> I know about the the conspiracy. I'm not falling into the conspiracy theory. I'm not falling into the vaccine. Blah blah blah. You know. But there's subtler. There's much more subtle. Uh, distortions and blind spots that that creep into all of us. So you need a secondary strategy, which is kind of like where you force yourself to to consume a certain amount of information from people you pretty thoroughly disagree with. Um, so those are just two two guidelines. You know, could say uh, a lot more, but that's plenty for now. Thank you. Thanks, John. And and also these I in my own experience, I find these toxins kind of accumulate in a way that I don't notice or can't regulate easily. And so, so I, I will suddenly find myself in a place where I feel disoriented or really anxious and not realizing that, you know, five minutes earlier, I was like, oh, you know, this is fine. Everything is going okay. And, and I, I would love to know if anybody has any clues, how we hear ourselves better so that we notice those moments, uh, how we raise a flag for ourselves, even, or for our partners uh, that that's going on, et cetera, just to, to be more aware of, of what that is. Um, Doug, Doug C. Uh, you're muted. You'd think by now I would have learned about that. It's okay. It's your first time on Zoom. <laughs> totally understandable. Uh, I think the first thing is to make sure that you're doing something that seems to be meaningful in the context the best you can. Um, it creates dignity and it creates a sense of, well, I tried. Uh, it didn't work, but uh, that's the way it is. Now, my proposal would be, and I don't know how to do this, is that if we take possibilities for how things could unfold and turn them into scenarios, so we don't have to choose which scenario is going to be uh, manifesting itself, but we have a set that seems to cover the possibilities uh, pretty well. I think it would be a really good thing to do. I don't know how to do it. Can you elaborate, elaborate on that just a little bit more? Well, if you take something like, uh, let's go all green uh, and turn that into a scenario so it's not so vague, so it has steps, then you can begin to see where it might actually succeed or where, it, where it's obviously going to break down. Mm -hmm. So you make some progress in the analysis of the field of possibilities uh, rather than arguing over, over which one is going to happen. Thanks. In storytelling or making a point, you know, a non-fictional kind of point in a presentation, I, I tend to refer to this as texture, which is like, what does it feel like? What are, what, are, what are the specifics of this thing on the ground? And a long time ago, I heard advice for writers about writer's block. Um, it was, I think it was one of my teachers long ago who said, uh, picture a building someplace in a specific place, picture a brick on the facade of that building, now tell me what happened to that building, you know, in the last hour or in the last day. You know, like, like, do something very specific and describe it. Uh, and Stuart's a professional writer, um, but in some in some sense, the more we understand the texture, the more real it gets, and also the more we start to let go of things we don't uh, realize don't actually work logically. Um, I remember a long time ago, I, I had to turn a. a a speech I was giving into a into a white paper, and the process of turning illustrative diagrams that I could hand wave over into actual logic that worked on the page, and and I wasn't rejecting because it made sense, was very and very enlightening. It, it corrected a lot of things I had taken for granted in the quick flyover. Go ahead, Doug. Yeah, an example of a scenario would be: uh, let's take all the gas uh, fueled cars and turn them into EVs. Right. So the analysis was that if we look at the amount of material it would take to replace all the current cars with EVs, it does not exist in the world. That amount of material isn't there. We can't do that. Okay, so then we scratch that scenario and move on to other plausible ones. That's the kind of procedure I see in spinning. Thanks, Doug. And I think that opens up the path for cleverness and innovations, because just because something big doesn't pencil out, it doesn't mean that something big isn't possible in some other hacky and interesting ways. So, so trying, to, trying to not shut down avenues because the major logic of it doesn't work, but rather preserve 
you know, spark some innovations in how to do that. Um, Grace, then Stuart, then Carl. Yeah, this is a really big question. I mean, I, I really, in many, I'm going to be personal on this, it's like, I really kind of wish that I didn't have, not, I was not totally, but there's something about me that wishes that my vision wasn't so big. Because getting the kind of funding that I need to do what I need, you know, what I've envisioned is like, I'm like, I don't know how to do that. And I'm sort of sitting here like, okay, well, and I think for me, there's a number of things that are balancing issues. One is certainly the emotional thing, I, and, I, and I live alone, and it's not simple. Like, it's not easy to just like, I kind of don't have somebody to lean on. And also, I work in an industry where a lot of people are quite a bit younger than I am, and I spent last week with a whole bunch of them, and there's a lot of mentoring and guidance that they ask for, which tends to drain my physical energy. And I wasn't really careful about that. I got quite, I'm still having a lot of um, physical discomfort based on sort of like this, I don't know, my energy healer has like a whole thing about that. And like the spiritual path. What's been useful for me, which is like kind of an oversimplification is being like, okay, well, we're in a war. It's kind of like a grand man. It's not clear what the war is. And there's certainly a, there's certainly, a, um, you know, online wars and certainly in the communications media, certainly a digital war. There's certainly a war between um, those of us who are really fighting for environmental preservation and human connection and those of us who are just trying to make a profit and not seeing the consequences of that. And so that has helped me a lot actually you know like okay well i know what side i think i'm on i could be on the, i could be on the evil side like we could all be the evil people on this side but I, I, this is the side i've chosen and there's going to be some injuries and some wounds and some emotional trials and it's probably going to go on for a decade and just kind of having that perspective it, it's maybe it's kind of a dumb simplified perspective but it definitely helps me to kind of say okay well that's what's going on I was noticing this morning that when you watch like a movie about like these heroes and stuff, they're never like, maybe I should just freaking go home and go back to my nine to five job. Like Clark Kent is never like, why don't I just like keep writing newspaper articles? It'd and be a shorter, it'd be a shorter movie, right? <laughs> it would be so much truer. Like every day I'm like, what, why don't I just, you know, like I could work like I do now, a few hours a day, make a living and have a pretty easy life and um, just be an observer. I mean, I'm not gonna win, right? Like what's the chance that we're gonna win this war? Like, ah, not great. Um, but I really do connect to what um, Doug said about like, okay, you do what feels like you're making a contribution and that does something. And I really connect to what you said about small acts. I mean, I was in this group of 40, young people yes last week and who knows which one of them like took a gem home and does have the energy to execute it um but yeah i do find it very difficult it's been this week has been very physically challenging i don't know when that's going to get resolved um or if it's going to get resolved and um yeah so i and and, and I think surrounding myself with co-founders who are can see what I see. Um, for me personally, it's been surrounding myself with a lot more women. Um, I'm finding that particular dynamic getting worse, like the dynamic between men and women getting worse. And I don't really know how to, you know, like I, I'm not, it's not the area in which I've chosen to act but I have chosen to only choose women as co-founders, um, but I haven't chosen to act in the area of trying to have more equality. I don't even think that more equality is the question here. I think the question is, it's very difficult for me to even look at this question, but there's a question about the things that I see about what economics is that are very easy for me to explain in a female environment and very hard to explain in a male environment. And um, 
yeah, there's something there that I can't quite put my finger on. So, yeah, anyway, but I think that having a mission and knowing what I want to do is really helpful and doing a little bit every day, like as much as I can do. Yeah, that's all. Um, can you just say a tiny bit more about this this thing you just said that, that things about economics that are easy to see or explain uh, among women, but hard in, in men. I, I, I empathize with what you said. I would just love to know uh, like a couple sentences more um, texture on it. So all the economic systems that men seem to be proposing around me and talking about and talking about modifying are based on this idea of work and labor and this idea that there's certain kinds of, that by working, you make your living in an economy. Mm -hmm. Now you can map that onto the, to, to Graver's bullshit jobs, which one of you guys quoted this week, Ken, I think posted it this week. Like, yeah, like really that's what's making money. And, and, and that quote that you said that there's an inverse relationship between how much you help people and how much money you have. It seems to be very true. It's certainly true in my in my day to day work. And so pointing this out, no matter how much I point it out, every time I talk to men about their new tokenomics and their new models, they're like, well, we're calling it contribution. I'm like, contribution to what? Contribution to the project. I'm like, okay. You know, and, and you have these DAOs, and, and the thing is, these DAOs and you're approving each other's contributions. And okay, let's say you're a woman and you know in a particular part of the world and you're pregnant for the third time and asking for maternity leave and your colleagues have to vote on that, right? What's your contribution? And so it's just backwards. And also most of what we do during the day isn't exchange, it's share. I mean, this, this whole call is share. Everything we do in this group is share. Everybody's been so generous with me in this group to share. The, like, are we going to keep track of that? As soon as we start keeping track of it, it starts to get cringy. And this seems to be, and then what people just say, like what guys will say is like, that doesn't scale. And it's like, well, why not? Right? Like, why not? But, you know, and it's just really, why don't we look into all the things that we share and the bulk of our economy, which is sharing and caring. And say what would that look like and, and so i think that's what's been really hard for me you know and people are like well but then people would produce anything and it's like you know i don't have to get started like i can just like i can just push the button on klaus who knows that the people are producing the really valuable stuff or the people who are screwed at the end of the line and, you know it's like, like our whole economy is on its head and but still every time i talk to people they're like our token represents work or contribution or you know well, we vote on each other, so we know what contribution is. It's different from it. it's like we're not going to get anywhere. I think we're not going to get anywhere in economics as long as we're trying to quantify things and compare their value to one another. And 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 I think to overgeneralize brutally, a um, very male response is things like markets and prices and you know mechanisms that will solve for a large crowd um and and we try to sort of impose that into contexts where there are commons and where there are intangibles and where there are other kinds of value circulating which those responses those solutions don't actually address and in fact in many cases just kill um and and, and you know I think this is just happening all around us. And we're, we're at a, this liminal moment where many different people are reinventing how we live together and how we how values created and moved around. And unless we open up to less normal conversations, we won't make it into a better system that easily. We'll, this will be replaced by robots that are enforcing a more brutal system or something like that. Yeah. And then you said that thing, like how value is created and moved around. I don't even know what you said. Yeah. Like we just use this word value, like value, value, value. And it's like, what the hell is that? Um, thank you. Thank you for, for indulging that. Uh, Stuart. Yeah. Um, so I think we all need to have our hard drives erased um, in terms of our thinking, you know, and I've had conversations with, with Doug about this and with um, 
Stacy about this, and we just we just need our hard drives erased. We're all living in in um, in conceptions that we've all outgrown. Um, it's true politically, um, and it's true um, economically. Um, I, I also wanted to say to Grace, um, there's some great stuff on Richard Rohr's daily um, missive about the grail. <laughs> Once we've seen the big vision and, 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 and accept the grail, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. You can't step back. It's just part of you know, how you're living and, and, and seeing, um, seeing in the world. Um, to speak to um, the great uh, uh, introduction that Ken provided, um, our leaders have totally failed us in terms of climate uh, because the message of how bad it is is only in the minds of people who have done some digging. Um, you know, the political leaders talk about it obliquely, but they really don't talk about how bad it really is. I guess they're afraid of catastrophizing in some ways. Um, but so, so people are just not aware and they continue to, to you know, live out in the way that they have been um, in culture. When I say we need our we need our hard drives erased, I really mean we we all need a completely different way about of thinking about what it is to be a human being in the world at this moment in time, on this on this planet. Um, it's just it's just you know absolutely essential. Um, people that you know the, the the folks who are living in the ghettos that that um, that Ken mentioned, um, they're in a place of resignation. And resignation breeds violence. There's nothing else to do um, but to act out, act out violently. Um, so, um, what's been my salvation over time is, um, <clears throat> you know, ten years of fighting down in the pits of the practice of law taught me how it doesn't work. The adversary system doesn't work at all, period. It's a terrible, terrible way of solving problems and it's getting worse and worse and worse. <clears throat> that said, I've just gotten into the TV show Suits, which is providing a, a, an amazing, an amazing, you know, little bit of, of escape about how, how, how not to do it and how people are living at that certain level. Um, Buddhist thinking has been a, just an extraordinary um, tool for me, but, but I mean, just really kind of stepping into it and, and developing the consciousness of, of awareness of when you're being violent, when you're being aggressive. And it really is amazing if you really start to dig down into that, some of the words we use, how we react to other people, um, it's just, it's just kind of um, critical um, to kind of recalibrate our own, our own kinds, of, kinds of thinking. It's been very, very useful to me. And mindfulness practice, you know, whether it's meditation or, or some form of, of, of movement of some kind, but, but really being aware of that kind. And I agree with Doug, the, the notion of having a mission the, 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 the mantra of do what you can where you are with what you have is just so, so, so um, important. So that's my two cents for now. Thanks, Jared. Uh, Carl. So yeah, with, um, with Doug's uh, comment, one of the things that came up um, for me was um, the um, scenario work that, I th that originated with the Shell Futures Group and your sorts and the art of the long view. Um, I think that evolved into the global business network um, type of thing. But my understanding of it was you you identify two dimensions. So you have the quadrant system. You come up with the most extreme scenario you can for each of those quadrants, and then whatever's going to happen is going to be some probably some kind of combination of all four, there's probably some validity in 
each of those scenarios and things. So um, that's something I'm taking a look at again to, um, yeah, it's interesting with uh, what Grace was saying, I'm, um, well, I'm working on my PhD and I've actually got a, um, my framework is about making contributions and, um, and having an impact. And um, uh, well, the one thing I'm a math, was a math major and stuff. So one thing I said, I'm not even getting near qual quantitative analysis. I'm looking at the various um, qualitative ones and it's kind of interesting, I guess not surprising that almost all the, uh, all the, uh, the vast majority of the um, qualitative uh, research methods have emerged out of the nursing communities like narrative inquiry and things. So um, yeah, actually, and then somebody, you know, it's one of those things because like this week has just been incredible because um, I had, I've had a couple of meetings and the posts and stuff, but on LinkedIn, somebody um, posted a, a thing about this. Ken, Ken Coleman has a book, um, it came out, I guess, late last year about from paycheck to purpose and stuff. So I'm taking a look at that. It's got all kinds of references to like more like it's not academic at all. So, but you know, it'll be some psychology today stuff. So there'll probably be some academic um, leads for me under that too. Um, and things. And then another. Um, uh, one of my primary mentors, a good um, friend of his, was the director of nursing at University of Indiana, and we talked. And he gave me all kinds of links, but one of them was to Meta Integral. I don't know if you're <laughs> you with that, but that um, it comes out of. I think I, he was just describing it as coming out of Ken Wilber's work. It was actually somebody that he knew at uh, he knew about it from Fielding. Uh, he actually has a certificate from. Field and Graduate Institute in Integral Studies. And he met, mentioned, uh, yeah, this Meta Integral, if you look at their website, which I'll post, they have a thing about 10 different kinds of capitalism and wisdom economies and all kinds they of- have a, They have a card deck called the Wisdom Economy Card Deck that I think my friend Christian Simsarian helped create. Yeah, well, as, as Ted Nelson says, everything is intertwingled. So. Isn't it? <laughs> sure enough is. Um, <laughs> thanks, Carl. Um, further down the Ks, Klaus. Yeah, <clears throat> I wanted to pick up on the theme that Doug started to, to uh, find ways to engage and in, 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 in be hopeful you know, about the future and see where uh, we can make an impact. And I, I, I mean, I have come to the conclusion that change has to be local. You know, it has to be bottom up originating from within the community. And there are some interesting experiments already. One, one of the best I've seen is uh, happening in Maine. <clears throat> Here are a couple of articles where the communities have decided to abandon uh, the regulations that govern and control and inhibits the food markets, which in turn uh, prevents small growers and small producers from uh, 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 selling into, into the marketplace. Um, so so those, those kinds of activities create jobs, first of all, you know, they create engagement, they mop up uh, the labor markets, they, they help people who are otherwise unemployable to, to uh, find a job. You see kibbutz type formations of intentional communities. So there is, this is the beginning you know, of this massive change, which, uh, which I think is what uh, Aaron Wittmer here is talking about. This is the, I mean, the, this is the, the um, this is first of all, the localization of economies, securing your own uh, the environment, securing your own watersheds, your own, uh, soil, you know, the, the, the food security, food sovereignty issues that are coming with that. Um, so I, I think if we, if we pick something that fits our own um, 
talents, you know, the, uh, aptitudes, interests, and so on. There are plenty of, of fantastic examples out there, you know, best practice examples <clears throat> that, that are worthwhile to emulate. Um, so in my case, because I'm so you know, singularly focused on, on food and food system, which uh, now I'm pushing hard to, to elevate to the same level as the energy sector, um, the, 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 that's a wide open field. There are so many points of engagement and potential to, to, to work constructively, whether you're in finance or like what Ken is doing is wonderful stuff. You know, so, so from, from many different angles, but you know, there, are other, there are other things and it has to be local. So I'm starting to engage locally now. And the first thing I realize is that I have to power way, way, way down because my assumptions and things that I see are just like, oh my God, yeah, what is this guy talking about? Um, so you have to really, you know, first of all, appreciate and accept the the uh, the place where people are. You know, not overwhelm, but just you know, start to to really engage there. So. Um, the local team here scheduled uh, a meeting with me with the local democratic candidate here, with uh, Jamie, and uh, so we can we have a chance to talk about uh, you know, bills that are pending that are going to be very impactful to our local community. So, so you 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 have so many ways. You know, write a letter to the editor. You know, engage with the League of Women Voters. Do all sorts of things that fit your temperament and and your and your interest, but by all means stay local. You know, go local because that's where uh, the the action really hits. But know what's happening at the meta level, you know, so you can direct your efforts locally. Mm -hmm. And that connection really is missing right now because the media isn't picking up on it. The media is not educating the public right in in ways that become where you become aware of resource depletion around you, you know, the, the climate crisis that's already unfolding, and what are the options that we have to engage and, and mitigate and, and be constructive about it. And I think once you see that, you know, once you see something that you can engage with, your mood changes, you know, your outlook changes, and, and your energy gets routed into constructive channels. You know. I want to I want to pull on the thread that I think Grace was putting in the chat while you were talking, which is that the food nexus is so massively important, and one way it plays out is jobs making food so we can pay for the five dollar a pound tomato. Which like, how do tomatoes cost so much? I don't understand. The other way to think about it is food that people can have without needing to have money, so that they are not hungry, so that they like eat really well and are healthy uh, with natural food, and 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 like. That's sort of, we don't talk about that end of it much at all. And recently, for some reason, I had to, I started looking at yard sharing or other kinds of schemes where people say, hey, you have a backyard, you're not doing anything. And if I come in and grow stuff and give you 10% of what I, what I harvest, is that cool? And those systems don't seem to be thriving. At least I had a hard time Googling like what was still there. That didn't seem to be a thing that was going on. Um, and so, so... I wish we talked more about those kinds of things and, and did more of that. There are massive opportunities for innovation, for startups, you know, for job growth, because local systems still need support uh, at the macro level. You need tools, you need systems, uh, you know, you need software, for example, all sorts of things that can that can accelerate the development of a community. So I'm engaging now with a consulting firm to to see if we can actually develop um, a product, you know, that and that sort of works like a brokerage function because you have you have oodles of of examples of wonderful startups and communities who are doing amazing things, but you have to pull them together because you have one group that's working on one technical aspect. But it needs to be combined with five others in order to really impact that at the community level. So this kind of knowledge brokerage, I think, is going to be a big thing uh, uh, moving forward. Thanks, Klaus. Uh, Stacy, then Wendy, then Grace. I just wanted to say, Carl, uh, uh, Klaus, I'd like to talk to you about that. That's exactly what I'm working on, generally speaking, is the improper like 
knowledge networks between them. So I'd like to have a conversation. Sure. Uh, Stacy. Yeah, so um, ironically, I had been thinking about Ken's question before I got on the call. And I wasn't going to talk about it because I had decided I need to write about this because I'm not very good at speaking off the cuff. And I certainly didn't want to get emotional or weepy, but I've been working on that issue probably for about two months and struggling with it, trying different things. But what Grace brought up really hit home because one of the things that I recognized, and it has to do with other comments that were made because I resonated with all of them, but one of the things that I realized is that everything that I do, I do for free. And I'm happy to do that because I always feel like I'm, you know, adding value in some way, whether it's to a person's life or to the bigger picture. But unfortunately, I recognize that in this world, if you're not getting paid for something, at least for me, eventually, if you're not getting recognition in some way, and there comes a time where you need to be fed and there's nobody there to feed you, you realize that something's off and you've done something wrong. So when we talk about doing us differently, it's hard to do us differently when the world is still the same. So I just wanted to put that out there. Thanks. Thanks, Stacey. And, and there's definitely sort of filter shifts, perspective shifts, attitudinal shifts that are really, really important here, or we don't solve for the things we're, we're sitting here talking about. Yeah, if I could just add one thing, because the short answer to the quest, to a few of the que both questions, is that um, I really focus on relationships. And I think that's going to be what saves the day. Who Who's around you when you look around, wherever you are. Awesome. Uh, Wendy? Um, great conversation. Thank you, everyone. I want to pull on the thread that um, was th that I feel like has popped up in a couple different comments um, along the way. That's about the how do we cope? How do we manage? How can we shift from the bottom up people's understanding and perspective and galvanize action? Um, it's funny. It reminded me. I forgot. <laughs> forgot I did this, but just like a month and a half ago or so, I was in a email thread with uh, Hank Kuhn and um, Wendy Elford talking about uh, youth mental health and the anxiety they have around climate change. And it went back and forth enough um, that I said, here, let me just give you a list of tools off the top of my head of what is already out there that I know exists for youth, but really it's for everyone. And so I, and then I threw it, thought it was rich enough. I threw it into a document and we haven't gotten back to it. So I'm sharing in chat now, the document that I put together. And I've, I just went back through it and I realized, okay, so first for anyone who wants to take a look at it, the first part is just the context of our email conversation around youth. Um, and then the second part is a list of tools, which again, are not comprehensive in any way, but at least give like a, and, and touch on things that people already talked about today. Um, you know, connecting with other people and building relationships is going to be a, a massive, it is not recognized in mainstream, but definitely recognized in the science in psychology as being the, you know, being essential to well-being and thriving. So those connections are going to become um, essential as we move forward and we deal with more crises and more stress. But then there's a bunch of other things in there, apps people can use, programs, uh, the role of stress in our lives and how it opens us up to growth and change, but then when it gets too much, it shuts us down. So how do we find that, that midpoint where we're motivated, but we're not, um, but we're not so overwhelmed, we end up doing nothing, right? So I try and I'm touching on a lot of stuff in there. And then at the end, I talk about my, my ideal, which is, was just mentioned actually twice, I think, which is what we really need if people have the tools to understand where their strengths are and their skills are, and not from the traditional sense, but from, from some of these newer, newer perspectives, then activating those strengths in service to something that matters to them helps to move what is just sitting anxiety that's not going anywhere into something actionable. And a knowledge network is going to be a huge piece of that. And I think technology has a role it hasn't had for a really long time or ever really. And in, in scaling up this one-to-one -one relationship 
that used to only happen, say, in a therapy session or in a coaching session or in a mentoring session where people are more capable of finding self-selecting and finding on their own where they're of best use and where they can take some action on something. So just wanted to share that. Happy to have more conversations or start a conversation on that document if it speaks to people. Then for me, generally, um, you know, I, I tend to love to work in inception spaces and spaces that aren't full, you know, clearly defined yet. Um, and I, um, I have, you know, in working with people who are uh, working in the sphere of meta project, I have gotten my head around enough of the pieces now that I have chosen to focus on regenerative agriculture, not with all my time and energy, but as a focus of all the conversations and thinking so that as I'm building processes, it is I'm using regenerative agriculture to bounce the ideas off of in order to help clarify what needs to happen next and start to clarify priorities. I just see so much potential through the people, momentum, energy, um, number of people involved that to this class is what you were talking about to help on another level to try to organize on a slightly, you know, try to be the mycelium around, try to be the glue sticking it together. What else can we do on a larger level to help organize all the great work that's already happening to try and advance it? That's where my energy is going. Cause if I don't do something, I'm going to explode. <laughs> Good night. Can I respond to that? Um, hang, hang on, Klaus. Uh, I was just thinking, why don't we take a take a breath for a moment? Um, and Klaus, if you'll remember what you're about to say, I'll go to you next. But let me just take us into silence for a little bit um, because I'm feeling a little anxiety from the pace of our conversation. And I figure that, may, that means maybe a couple of us are. So um, I'll bring us right back out. Everyone take a couple of slow, long breaths, please. Um, Klaus, uh, then Stuart, then Doug. And Doug, I hadn't seen your, your hand up, but I'm glad you put your virtual hand up as well. So let's go Klaus first. Yeah, I mean, in response to, to focusing on youth, and uh, I was in a conversation with, with Jean's workshop uh, in Shimo and Waldvogel, who was also an OGM member, but making a presentation on how he's thinking about assisting children uh, in the first thousand days of development. And so you had a you know, very complex uh, uh, set of, of uh, Kumo maps and thoughts and so on. And what came to mind for me is that go back to Maslow here and, and where is the hierarchy of needs really? It starts with food security. Uh, it starts with food and then shelter and then safety. So take a look at this, uh, these two charts here, which I uh, uh, part of then. One six, every sixth child in the United States is food insecure. And when you think about the trauma that causes, now, first of all, the, 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 the brain cannot develop adequately, normally and, and fully, unless you have the nutrients that are, that are required for the brain to to evolve you, you know and our food is nutrient deficient and in many cases it's not even available and so my, my wife worked uh, uh in in a school that was 98 percent hispanic very poor they had like zero resources in coachella valley you know, whereas the community next door had more money than they knew what to do with but that's just part of the 
of the uh, uh, local city of the American uh, funding of school systems here. But it's really important to think about um, providing food, shelter, and and safety first uh, to before uh, the mind uh, is open to to receive training and messaging. Now, and so if the, and so so we. Uh, so I think any intervention here has to be built along that hierarchy you know, to 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 uh, put that. And there are some wonderful examples of what communities are doing to pull kids that are that are without parents or parents that are dysfunctional off the street and put them into after school workshops and what have you. Um, so so that just that just came to mind. So, so Wendy, that that really hits me. I wrote a paper. Uh, I wrote a paper. I mean, I, I put put together some thoughts for the local superintendent of the school, and I um, started teaching some classes. They had a computer lab sitting there with thirty iMacs, which they needed for testing. But otherwise, this thing was sitting empty. So I asked them to to collect some of the smartest kids in the school and give them to me for a couple of days a week. And so I, I created a computer lab and I was using like Khan Academy and coach.org uh, and, and, and uh, teaching games you know, to work with these kids. And it was amazing how they bloomed, you know, and, and became so interested uh, in, 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 um, in, in joining and talking and so on. So that, again, you know, there's a ton of things we can, we can do. Um, okay. Um. Thanks, Klaus. A small thing, when you put that article in, I, I went and looked at it, and I immediately went to Michael Pollan saying that nutrition is not food. Uh, and, and so that the whole conversation about, you know, eat, eat food, mostly plants, not too much, uh, as, as like good blanket advice. And um, so anyway, I just wanted to fold that back into the, into the conversation. Oh, let's go Stuart, then Doug. Yeah, just two quick comments. One, um... In terms of different kinds of thinking, um, the idea of, um, and it's often talked about in terms of um, non-dualism, but the essence of that is that we're, we're, we're one cell in a, in a greater whole. And, and so much of the, the, the education and the cultural brainwashing has been about um, you know, aggrandizement of the individual and, and individual accomplishment and blah, 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 blah. And each one of us is just, you know, one cell um, in, 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 in one little system. You know, if you think about all of the systems in the human body and how um, they differentiate into organs, but each little cell is contributing to some, some bigger capacity for, for life and, and living and the miracle of that. And, and how do we shift our own brain into... Uh, thinking that way it's 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 much more eastern way of thought that we're part of a larger community and it's not the aggrandizement of the individual and just to to pick up on that um schmachtenberger who many of us uh have a lot of respect for you know talks about how with shifting of algorithms in um in in some of the mass media that's out there we could shift that that thinking um, in a shorter period of time than most of us would think possible. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, Doug, uh, you're muted. What do I do? Okay. Every, every sitcom needs a running gag, so I think this is working really <laughs> this well. Is it. Uh, I always wanted to be the running gag. Ah, I um, think you've achieved running gag. It, it would have improved my relationships in grade school. <laughs> uh, if we start out with the idea that's very popular here of going local with agriculture in particular and think of it in terms of scenarios you think okay if you do that how does it play out against rising temperatures uh, is there a strategy for what to do with local agriculture that copes with rising temperatures if not we've got a lot of work to do if so then it will suggest what we need to do. Thank you. And one of the things that just keeps showing up for me is 
given how complicated all these issues are, we have no blackboard where we can each contribute what we see and what we understand and what the options are. The, really, the, the space for sharing the logic and the evidence and the paths and the stories is still not there. And I keep wrestling with how do we explain what I call the big fungus and how do we help people feed the big fungus in a way that feeds all of us, that metabolizes information well, so that decisions like the ones we're talking about, how do I find a thing to do now that has meaning and will contribute to the whole are easier to, to address. Ken. Um, thank you. I really have appreciated hearing people on this, uh, this topic because um, it's near and dear to my heart. Uh, I'm in the middle of a book called The Nutmeg's Curse by Amitav Ghosh, which I would not have found without Bill Anderson. And I have to say, it's really an amazing book. It's a hard book to read because it, it really looks at um, uh, some very difficult aspects of human nature. Um, it's also a wonderful book to read because he's an amazing writer. Um, one of the things he points out, which which I linked to a few months ago, I posted a talk by uh, Bayo Akomolafe, uh, uh, who says, you know, we don't ascribe agency to anything other than ourselves. And this comes up repeatedly in the Netmix curse that the world is alive. And in the, the uh, early 1600s, there was a, a notion taking place in Europe, a new philosophical view of um, uh, the earth as inert and it's only productive when people work it. And so when the Europeans came to the Americas, you know, they saw this land that looked wild and they're like, the reason we can take over the land is because the Indians aren't working it. Therefore, they don't own it. We're making it productive. Now it's ours and we can do with it what we want. And um, this idea of the world being alive is really uh, missing, I think, in a lot of our, and when I say our, I'm talking about uh, westernized global northern culture has forgotten the world is alive, that we came out of the earth. Um, and when we start to look at the agency of the planet itself, then climate change makes a lot of sense. We have altered the chemical balance of the planet. We have altered the biochemical balance, the, you know, we're, we've altered the, the uh, heat trapping capacity and the planet is, has agency. It is adapting exactly as it would. And I think we forget, we, I'm really working on this week. I think it's so easy to um, forget that we live in a world that is alive because it's been taken out of our cultural lens for so long. Yeah. And so when I am struggling, um, I mentioned in the, in the chat, I go to Wendell Berry's Mad Farmer Liberation Front. You know, I go and lay down where the where the Drake lies, and I I I lay on the earth. I will go and lay on the ground and be quiet and look at the sky, and feel what what's what can how can I draw on this larger power, this this larger thing that has no. Um, it, it's personal in that it brings people forth, but it's very impersonal. And I just listen for the wisdom of the rocks. Um, and it's, I, I just, I would like more people to start to recover this sense of being part of a living world as opposed to being part of an inert uh, planet that's just there to be torn up and exploited. And, and um, yeah, more rock music. Thanks, Jerry. It was good. Um, instead of heavy metal. <laughs> oh, I like that. All right. I'll stop. I like that a lot. Um, thank you, Ken. That's a that's a lovely meditation. And I didn't know about that essay of, of Barry's that manifesto. So I, I will read it when we're done here. Uh, Julian. So I had a question about something you just wrote and what Ken was just talking about. We hear so often stories about how indigenous cultures live with the earth instead of stomping on it. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, in your comment, you talk about the European view and some long time ago, the Europeans were the indigenous cultures of their locality and what happened to turn that notion of living with the earth into one of stomping on it so what's um what's the there was a book i read a very long time ago that talked about uh, the pursuit of witches across europe it might have been leonard schlein's alphabet versus the goddess maybe uh, and basically there was a lot of indigenous wisdom all across europe and we managed to go hunt it down and stamp it out like all over the place and replace it with 
the religion of the time or whatever else. But but you're I think you're you're totally right. We my own amateur thesis on world history is we through lots of trial and error, including lots of error that wiped out tribes everywhere, we learned how to live in community on the commons all around the earth. Then we had this weird, abnormal, aberrant period where a couple of cultures that had guns, germs, and steel basically took over the world and imposed a series of worldviews that were mechanistic, theistic, or monotheistic, et cetera, et cetera, on everybody. And the we here is very dangerous, I agree. Um, and, and so I think a piece of what happened was the undermining of us, we, and turning it into me and we, as we now kind of practice them, maybe I'm saying that poorly, but, but, um, but we are still suffering from this, this aberrant period. And when you say decolonization to someone who doesn't believe in it, they're like, oh my God, this is terrible. You shouldn't even be talking about this. And yet for me, a lot of the dysfunctions and warped lenses of our current conversations and our, our, our conversation here today to try to figure out how do we tip the lens so that it isn't so based on the, the artifacts that don't make actual sense for a thriving world. I think that's, that's a big piece of it. Yeah, that's quite a task because one theme I noticed in what you just said over the last 60 seconds was that religion was a big part of it. Yes, I'm afraid I believe that. It was a huge, huge, big piece of it. Uh, Stacy, then Ken, please. Yeah, I, I just want to bring it back to like us and people. And I'm just, just the idea, think about it. They teach women that if you need help, don't yell help, yell fire. Think about that. Thanks, Stacey. Ken? Uh, Julian, I wish I had an answer to your question because it's a really good one. It's a question that is kind of at the heart of the dawn of everything. Um, if you've looked at the dawn of everything, and I don't blame people who haven't because it's a really big, hairy book, but um, they ask this question of how did we get stuck with this idea that some of us are better than others and that there's a natural hierarchy and you know we need to be led because that's not the way human beings existed for many, many hundreds or many, many tens of thousands of years. Um, it's like where did manifest destiny come from? Well, yeah, that's that's a little bit further down the line, but you know, they, they make this point of at some point somebody said, This land is mine and you can't be on it. Now, up until that point, all land belonged to everybody, it belonged to the tribe, you know, and, and so most people, as soon as that would arise, would laugh and say, You can't claim this land. But somewhere along the line, it became okay to say this is ours. And then then we started to defend our land and and then we started to actually, you know, um uh go out and take other people's land. And, and how did this state of affairs come about? And I'm coming up on the last chapter of the book and I haven't seen the answer to that. So if anybody has the answer to that, I would love to know it, but it has been part of our, oh, Doug, yes, please. Yeah, I think a piece of it goes like this. In early Greece, uh, people were herders of cattle. And at a certain point, the number of cattle was large enough that people started thinking, which cattle goes with which group of people? And that was fine for a while because you got a kind of implicit ownership. Mm -hmm. Then as the amount of cattle went up, a new thing emerged and that was, hey, the cows have to eat grass. So we've got to not only worry about who owns the cattle, but we've got to worry about who owns the grass. So the idea came of dividing the earth into equal plots. Uh, and of course that broke down because the plot that's on the hillside does not have the same value as the plot that's in the river valley. But the idea was there. So uh, the word that's used by Plato for law is nomia. And the early version of that word in Greece was equal distribution. So the first thought was, how do we divide the world up into equal distribution so it's fair? And of course, as we know, they can't do that in a world where the land is so various because there is no equal to define. So, but you've got the idea of law as an intermediate reality to try and make it as fair as possible. And that struggle is still with us. Um, 
I'm mixed, Doug, because in Mongolia to this day, the people out on the steppes share the grasslands and they wrote, they move around like, like they don't have fences. They just figure out like how communally together, how to share the resources. Uh, same thing for water coming off the mountain in Bali uh, through Hindu ritual. Same thing for lots of places where we figured out uh, kind of Eleanor Ostrom-ish uh, means for sharing and improving the commons across a large community. And, and the problem is we have this, I think we have this fiction in our head that too many people spoil all commons. We have the tragedy of the commons. So therefore we need ownership and rules. And, and there's this interesting squishy sort of middle ground of how do you create communal regs that keep the commons actually thriving and create abundance at every turn. And we've, we've, we've lost that practice. We've been, even lost that belief that that's possible. And once you get a dynamic that generates abundance, and I think regenerative ag is like right on the tail of that, of that mission. So I'm, you know, I'm thrilled so many of us are hot and heavy on, on regenerative ag, because I think rege the regenerative economy plays with this dynamic in a really healthy and, and wonderful way, which is one reason I'm enthusiastic about it too. Um, but I think we, that's part of the mental flip here is that we think things are impossible that aren't that impossible. They just take some work and some, some hard won insights. Um, I, I want to go to Paul. Wait, I just want tandem. to say one thing about go that, ahead. which go is ahead, when Grace. I teach this thing about the commons yeah. in my workshops, I always talk about like the plate of sushi. Like we're all sitting around the table on the plate of sushi. Why don't you just grab the whole thing? And that really gives you insight to what people's nature really is. It's like, when everybody's watching and you care about the friendship, it, it's like, it's natural to share. And if there wasn't enough for everybody, you'd be like, you know what, I'm going to just take left. It's very natural. There's nothing, there's nothing weird about that behavior. It's... I love that, Grace. Thank you. Um, Paul, you had jumped in earlier, but then you took your hand down. I'd love to, I, I'm glad, I'm thrilled you're on the call. I'd love to hear what you want to say. Um. Yeah, we're in a heat wave, so I have to work outside until it gets hot, and so um, it's too hot, so I got here a little earlier, so I was able to log in. Um, I, I And I took my hand back down. I was just one person asked, how did we get to this place of, uh, and it just reminded me of Little House in the Prairie, which has this great section at the very end that Pa has moved his whole family out into the Indian Territory, Oklahoma, worked for a year or two. The Indians are upset and the cavalry comes and tells them they have to leave. This is Indian country. And as they're packing up and as they leave on their wagon, Pa is going, what's the logic of this? We made something in this land. The Indians just kind of just sit there doing nothing with the land. We were the ones working the land. We should have the land. And it's just a really great soliloquy from a lady who I think looked up to her father. And it's just a really honest statement of where that mentality was back then. Thank you very much. Really appreciate that. Um, Gil. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Jerry. Um, going back to what uh, Ken and Doug were saying, um, I think the Greeks were very late in this process. Um, there had been all sorts of distribution schemes, uh, empires and commons long, thousands and thousands of years before the Greeks. So that's not where the pivot is. Uh, it's the question that Wengro and, uh, and Graeber are exploring in that book. And one of the things that was, that was a marvel for me in the dawn of everything <clears throat> is the assertion that there were cultures that moved in and out of hierarchical and collaborative relationships uh, based on seasons, based on landforms and so forth. There are cultures that were different, strikingly different in similar places and cultures that move through different modes uh, with some intentionality. Um, and, um, oh. you know, the stuff that that we, we assert and take for granted are retrojections. There, you know, there are attempts to explain the past through the world that we live in now. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, uh, uh, support, supported the, the, the David's assert by these two apparently contradictory, but actually very similar myths of the Rousseau and Locke versions of how humans evolved to where we are now. Um, you know, the, for me, the power of the book is that uh, if they're correct in their assertions, uh, um, different worlds are possible because different worlds have existed. 
you know, I, I keep going back to this great Ken Bolden quote that existence is proof of the possible. And you can't tell me something's impossible if you can show me that it's already happening. Uh, and I think that runs through a, the work of a lot of us in this group is trying to manifest examples of something different. Um, you know, it's not just that people laughed at the guys who said, this is all mine, uh, which is a wonderful thing to kind of like, you know, I'm the boss of all of you, <laughs> get out of here, go, go, go take a bath or something. Um, but also that there were, um, there was ritualistic play around dominance. You know, somebody would be king for a day, but not forever. Or somebody would be king for a day and then thrown off the cliff as part of the ritual ceremony. There was, you know, there was a very different kind of relationship to power and dominance in at least part of humanity for at least part of our existence. And there were many matrilineal societies as well with very different and were, regimes. And many, many, I mean, that's, you know, it, it's hard to pull a single message out of the book, but one of them for me is that enormous variety of human cultural and organizational experience. So we have that capacity to experiment and explore and play. Um, and I think what they're proposing or, you know, is that, you know, can, are there ways that we can rediscover that, reform that within this very locked down world of the last few hundred years where kind of everybody knows certain things. Uh, Jerry, you said before that you think religion was part of the problem. Well, the indigenous cultures of Europe um, had religion. It was before the Roman religion and the Roman Empire arrived. And that may be one of the pivotal elements. You know, we, we think of ourselves as descended from the classic civilizations in Greece and Rome. Uh, that may be where we went wrong. We, again, we always in quotes in honor to Ken. Ken, you've completely ruined my, my, my speaking and listening ever since oh. you raised this. Yeah. So it's, no, it's just, no, it's it, we or us or I, we, whatever it is. It's just that, um, my observation is that humans tend to use the word in many different senses, often in the same sentence. And so I'm just, a, you know, thank you, Ken Homer. I'm just kind of attentive to noticing how the connotation of we is constantly shifting and has enormous implications because what I'm thinking when I say that may have nothing to do with what the, you know, 15 of you are thinking when I say that. Um, it's a word with a very messy meaning. Um, Ken, you may be about to do this, but I was about to ask you if you would riff for a moment on the notions of we and what it means so that we might soak in it a little bit better and longer. We'd be happy to do that. <laughs> I'm using the royal we now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it was really um, lovely that so many of the women on the OGM list spoke up and said, yeah, I resonate with this because I think women often are included in a we where they don't feel included at all. And, you know, there's many times on these calls and in other areas of my life where someone says we, and I'm like, I'm not part of that we. And yet you're including me as part of that we. And, and so you make assumptions about what I believe or what I feel. And um, I am just as guilty. I'm hardly an expert at this. This is brand new territory for me. But I think it's simply a really good mind experiment to start to pay attention to when we on this call hear the word we being used by somebody to really inquire who is the we being referenced here and am i part of that we and are you making a generalization that that really doesn't include me or um and, and i i chose uh, somebody wrote me off list and said you know what's the difference between we and us they're, they're pretty much the same grammatically and i simply chose to use us dot x or us dot n out of Tyson um, uh indigenous, the aboriginals say us too, as in us too are walking along or us here, you know, us in this call. And I just, I think it's a, a very useful way to start to improve the precision of our language and our thinking because it forces us to be a whole lot more inclusive and a whole lot more um, respectful of the people that we are talking with. Thanks, Ken. Um, Mr. Brother Breitbart. Yeah, I um, the the sort of negative space active counter version to that is um, if the principle is when people speak, if they can speak in the first person. And uh, it 
can have a very powerful shifting and effect because if I no longer have a we to invoke and I'm no longer gonna purport to speak to, for everybody, it, it raises the bar in terms of the level of intention and ownership and authorship of what I'm about to throw into the pot. And um, I'm usually the person immediately responsive to somebody who invokes a we and my, you know, the response is, what do you mean we pale face? Like, uh, you know, maybe that's not me. And it is a projection. Um, it's a very powerful pr projection. I think it almost borders on um, violent communication. But we're desensitized. Yeah. You, I just invoked the we. We. <laughs> the we. The we. The we thing is, is, is a steady state, low grade level of violence that, you know, I'm very, I'm very sensitive to, but most people don't react to or take note of. They don't experience it that way. We've been, you know, socialized. It's like, that's okay. You can do that to me and I can do that to you. Thanks, Doug. And I think um, overgeneralization is one of these sort of low grade, quiet kinds of violence, so usually often by mistake, because people use things like we and paint way too broad a brush, uh, ignoring the ways in which other people in the conversation aren't included in, in whatever it is they're generalizing about. But, but we brush past a lot of overgeneralization. It happens constantly. And once you start listening for it, uh, Unfortunately, it probably happens all the time. And anyway, um, thanks, Doug. Uh, Carl. Uh, this actually gets at a, a, a core issue for me because I mean, just how do you explain your thoughts? If I, if I say I or my opinion or whatever, it's like, oh, Carl's got this huge ego. He thinks he's solved all the world's problems. And then if I say we, <laughs> then it's like, oh, I'm asking people to do things and stuff but what how do you how do we I mean we as a plea to our tribe <laughs> you know which uh, we're, and we're all part of multiple tribes but it's like people using we doesn't mean they're necessarily trying to get you to do something they're just saying this is an idea that I think we need to be working on <laughs> but you know so as I said that's a, been a ma that's really a major issue for me so I'm intrigued with this whole and Carl, you've just you just put a dynamic in the conversation that we haven't pointed to yet, but it's super interesting, which is a whole bunch of people don't feel like their opinion needs to guide the room or is valuable or is important or whatever that may be, or will be taken seriously, or there's a whole bunch of ways I could sort of say that sentence. Um, and so starting with I or I believe, or just starting with an assertion, doesn't actually work for them the way they've been raised, the way they frame their presence in the, in the group or something like that. Um, and I'm just talking out of my ass here because uh, I, I'm overgeneralizing, but, but I think that that's a, that's a dynamic that is really important here as well. Wendy. Mm. I was just gonna offer up that, the, the idea that this is a practice and a forever journey, not a rule. <laughs> and the way I choose to practice it is to become more aware. And that's what I hear other people saying, to become more aware of how I'm using we to make sure. And so sometimes it's, just, it's as simple as putting qualifiers around it. Um, while I'm speaking, which which probably don't even hit people, they sound so natural, you know. So I might say, some, choose to say something like, "So for those of us in this room, we blah blah blah, right?" Or I might say, "For the women that I have spent time with, we have felt right." And so it just encourages me to frame the we and not just assume the we is understood by the people that I'm speaking to. Um, and then sometimes it transfers itself to an I. I realize I really mean I. 
And then I, and that, and that changes the framing of the sentence. It might change the grammar of the sentence. It might change the whole idea and the way I'm framing it. So I, th I think regularly now um, about, and it's become more of a habit. So I, I, I'm not saying I'm consciously weighed down by it, but the initial shift is certainly, certainly takes some investment of time and energy. I have, I have felt in order to make that shift and then making that shift. I find that I'm clearer, I'm more articulate. Um, my ideas are received better. Um, and so it has a, it's had a huge positive effect in my life. Um, I think people generally feel, I know when people use, we, even this conversation, I feel put upon, like it feel, it feels like ideas are being put upon me, um, as I receive it. And I'm constantly going, well, that one's all right. Let that one pass. No, that one's okay. I'll let that one pass too. Like, and it's, again, it's very subtle and I'm not thinking about it all the time, but eventually it rises depending on the group and depending on who, what's being said, it rises to the point of feeling like my, if I were to share my voice, it would be in such contrast to what's, what's in the room already that I feel I can't speak. So, um, and it's subtle, but, um, so just offering that up is what is felt to me and receiving it and also what I've tried to do and shifting it. Thank you very much. That really helps. Um, Stuart, and then I'd love to bring the conversation that Ken and Grace are having in the chat into the, into the voice space. Yeah, just to pick up on what Wendy just said, um, nonverbal. Uh, is so important in all of this that the tone of the voice that you use the body language that you use is just you know really really critical in the messages that that others receive and also uh i have a sense that uh, and i'm not a, a a student of linguistics but somewhere in indigenous cultures the 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 use of the words i and we <laughs> were different not part of the language in some ways because of the um what was engendered by the use of those terms you know I'm, i don't know that for a fact but i'm just going to bet that if we dug into that we we would find some very different articulations and and words used in different cultures um thanks Stuart. you're reminding me and do we have any japanese fluent speakers in the room pete i know you learned Jap japanese for a while but i think in japan it's hard to say i like like linguistically there's not a lot of i this i want i i whatever that's not sort of a, a part of the language structure easily and or culturally um but i'm not sure about that so if anybody knows better or knows of it's, it's easy to say i but culturally you, you wouldn't say it that way yeah it's interesting um we are close to the end of our call um anybody who would like to um offer a some words about this conversation just a little reflection on where we've gone let's do a little bit of meta on on this call. Stuart? Yeah, just uh, quickly. I noticed that there are a lot of really good ideas here, um, <clears throat> but I haven't seen um, or don't sense that there's any action. In other words, we're a group of individuals who have come and shared our perspective, our thoughts, uh, blah, da, 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 da. but there's, there's nothing, no concerted action coming out of this. Um, that's just an observation. It's, it's neither good nor bad. And I think we've talked about at times, you know, the purpose of the group um, and whether or not uh, the group wants to be um, activist in any way, but just my observation, uh, meta observation. And it was a great conversation. Um, um, Stuart, thanks for prying open the Pandora box there. <laughs> um, and, and, also, and also, this is a very tiny thing. This is a really tiny thing, but I take lots of notes during the calls and I try to perfect them after the calls. And then I pu publish them openly into this weird piece of the fungus that is my brain. And I feel like that's a, what happens for me in pretty much all of our conversations here is a lot of things are crystallizing, a lot of evidence or storytelling 
or personal anecdotes show up, a lot of insights show up from all of you. And I'm trying to sort of glue them together into a more permanent artifact uh, that hopefully gets better over time. And that's not a huge action in the world, but it's a tiny thing to try to, to make some sense of what we're doing. Um, and I think each of us uses a lot of what we hear or learn from in these conversations, either as sustenance, as Grace has pointed out many times uh, in her visits here, uh, or as inspiration for things that we're busy working on. So uh, I meant to bring Ken and Grace into the conversation. I don't know if we want to or have time to. If you'd like to, that would be great to do. And then we have Klaus and Wendy, and we're out of, out of the call. So let me go to Ken and Grace and see, because there was a, an interesting conversation in the chat about what I'll put under the umbrella of political correctness or politically correct speech or, or you know. Um, uh, I just the, have a hard stop, so I got to go. All right. That, that's the answer to that. Thanks, Grace. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, was hard to violent of uh, terminology? So. No, no, no. <laughs> all right, see. You could have said I have a neck chop stop and that would have been very different. Oh, oh. Yeah. Um. So let me go to Klaus and Wendy, and then Ken, if you if you want to jump in at the end, that'd be fine. But let's go, Klaus. Yeah, in 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 response to what Stuart was just saying, I think it would be difficult for us to have a communal action, so to speak, because we are coming from so many different places. But I think where we benefit is at meta level thinking, because at meta level, if we understand where uh, where this ship is going, so to speak, where we when we understand the uh, the resource depletions that are happening, just meta level um, uh, natural forces that are pushing us forward in 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 directions we have no control over. We can once we understand that we can then independently and individually uh, make a call on how that impacts us and the environment that we have some form of control over. So I think the benefit of this conversation is if we stay at meta level, you know, and, and look at, at these larger uh, um, uh, influence factors, and which is what, what my point was of looking at the bigger picture economics, you know, that are, that are uh, going to, to, uh, to drive us. Thank you. Uh, Wendy? Yeah, thank you, Klaus. Um, I like that too. I like that this group is a place um, uh, for meta thinking and to hear kind of people's perspectives. Um, and I also have a suggestion. One thing we could do is say you feel calling to help weave action, Jerry. We could do a simple exercise at any time. Um, but maybe a half an hour before the end of the call, 15 minutes before the end of the call, or maybe even at the end of the call, uh, towards the end of the call, where people can put in a waterfall fashion in chat, what has answer kind of this question, what has this conversation galvanized for you or what action are you planning to take in the next week or two because of this conversation? And what that can do if we do it earlier than the very end of the call is people can see, you know, what what others are planning to do. And if there's synergy, they can capitalize on it. They can reach out to each other. Whereas right now we're kind of going off and we're assuming everyone's doing separate things, but maybe maybe in a couple of cases we're not. And there's an opportunity for, oh, wait, you're gonna talk to this person. I was gonna talk to that person. That's in the same organization, whatever, right? It could at least start to, to weave people um, to do some better work together in between meetings. We mm -hmm. could even potentially, if there's enough synergy uh, arising, we could even say, make it the next week's um, OGM call, right? Where people, we carry that thread from conversation of one week into everyone's check-ins, but everyone's check-ins are related to that thread, right? So that we invite even deeper dives into what people are doing, but they, they share the pieces that are relative to that particular thread instead of just all their pieces in general. Thank you, I like that. Um, general sentiment. Sound good? Um, it'd be lovely to do. Okay, so um, someone remind me uh, during their next call to stop and uh, and do that, and we'll do that. That sounds great. Oh, put it on someone else, Jerry. Yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> I just I just put it on the we. 
<laughs> yeah, good, good move. Yeah, yeah. So, Ken, uh, if you will take us out with a poem, that would be lovely. Sure. I, I want to thank everybody for joining this conversation, for, you know, indulging me in my in my question. Uh, it's been very rewarding for me. I hope it worked for other people, too. So um, William Stafford is one of my all-time favorite poets, and this is the first poem of his I committed to memory about 30 years ago. It's called The Ritual to Read to Each Other. Mm. If you don't know the kind of person I am, and I don't know the kind of person you are, a pattern that others made may prevail in the world, and following the wrong God's home, we may miss our star. For there's many a small betrayal in the mind, a shrug that lets the fragile sequence break, sending with shouts the horrible errors of childhood, storming out to play through the broken dike. And as elephants parade, holding each tell elephant's tail, but if one wanders, the circus won't find the park. I call it cruel, and perhaps the root of all cruelty, to know what occurs, but not recognize the fact. And so, I appeal to a voice, to something shadowy, a remote, important region and all who talk. Though we could fool each other, we should consider, lest the parade of our mutual life get lost in the dark. For it is important that awake people be awake, or a breaking line may discourage them back to sleep. The signals that we give, yes or no or maybe, should be clear the darkness around us is deep i'm going to sit here in silence for a little while anybody who'd like to sit in silence for a while is welcome to and then uh, drop off when you feel like it thank you ken that was perfect <laughs>